Who's Your Favorite Batman is a simple little party game that's fun for the whole family. You can go ahead and play a round or two the next time your internet goes out and you're forced to talk to your family face to face for more than five unbearable goddamn minutes. There's a bunch of answers that you're initially gonna get. Kevin Conroy, Michael Keaton, and Christian Bale will most likely be the top answers. The younger Alpha Zoomer commandos are probably gonna clamor all over Robert Pattinson because that man will forever have a permanent psychic lock on any woman under the age of 22 no matter how old he gets. And one jokester or two that you know may love the comedic stylings of Adam West's performance more than any of the grimdark modern offerings, and I can't necessarily blame anyone who picks him or Will Arnett for the exact same reason. But you know who no one is going to pick? All-Star Batman, as portrayed in All-Star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder. Mostly because, in the wise words of your heavily drunk uncle, no one cares about your weirdo cartoon crap. Get a real girlfriend, why don't you? Which we all know is drunk uncle code for All-Star Batman and Robin sucks, but you don't, my favorite nephew. I love and respect you. Here, here's $300. There's no better way to explain why All-Star Batman and Robin is just the worst Batman thing ever to exist ever than to read it. I don't have a long rambling history section for context here. All you need to know, and a fact that I really want you to keep in mind as we go through this garbage, is that this comic was written by Frank Miller between 2005 and 2008. If you have any semblance of knowledge or love for comic books, you know that that's a name with a hell of an impressive rap sheet. Frank Miller is responsible for two of the best Batman comics ever, The Dark Knight Returns and Batman Year One, as well as Sin City, 300, and a smattering of a lot of other good offerings. But he's also responsible for a version of Batman so dickish that he has his own separate page on the Villains Wiki that calls him a sociopath with a childish personality who overreacts to everything with extreme violence. And lastly, the other thing that you need to keep in mind is that all of these issues, for the most part, sold well and were within the top 10 comic releases of the month they came out. Issue 1 of this series was the highest selling comic book for months after it came out. So it wasn't like this was some side series that DC pumped out for cash. This thing was popular and will easily cause intense and voluntary vomiting if you bring it up in a comic book store near you. Now, by the way, quick side note, the full title of this series is All-Star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder, which is important to note because there is a second entirely unrelated series called All-Star Batman, just All-Star Batman. I have never read that one, and I have not been told that that one is the worst thing ever, like I've been told All-Star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder is, so we're just going to ignore that other one. For simplicity, whenever I say All-Star Batman, I'm referring to this series we're talking about specifically. So let's just read it already. Let's just get together and read the comic that's 10 issues that are only 20 pages each. It's pretty short. Why am I still standing here? I'm padding the runtime of the video so I can get more of that delicious ad revenue, duh. But now it's time for me to read comic books. Okay, I'm off to do that. We begin with Dick Grayson flying through the air with the greatest of ease because he's a daring young man on the flying trapeze and smiling gleefully about how much he just really, really loves his parents parents, and how they'll always, always be there to catch him before he falls. But enough dramatic and touching irony, we need boobs, gazongas, mama o memories We need to smash cut to local Gotham reporter Vicky Vale standing in her underwear in her high-end apartment. Vicky does the hilarious and totally not tired bit of ranting about how much she finds Batman to be a nuisance, but thinks Bruce Wayne is the most charming, most charismatic motherfucker to ever live. And the whole time DC Comics makes sure to keep its primary demographic entertained by a accompanying this rant with gratuitous ass shots. Oh, hey, you know what? Speaking of gratuitous skin exposure, you want to see something fucked up? 
If I was a woman and did this, this video would be banned off the platform. But because I'm a man and not doing this in a sexual way, I can sit here fully exposed, flabby body and all. Thanks, incredibly arbitrary censorship laws. Alfred calls up Vicky Vale to tell her to put a fucking shirt on because Bruce Wayne wants to take her out on a date, and we need a fashion montage to drive in just how mind-blowing this is for her. According to an article of 1999's issue of world-renowned multidisciplinary science journal Nature, the average woman in America requires at least four to ten different sexually provocative outfits in order to satisfy the desire and attention-seeking centers in her brain. If she doesn't have these things for prolonged amounts of time, it can lead to violent outbursts, irrational behavior, and even permanent mental disorders in severe cases. I also just made that entire thing up, but I'm hoping that some guy out there paused the video right after I said all that and is now looking for the article in question so he can send it to his girlfriend to explain why she's such a bitch, and it just gets him in a shitload of trouble. What does this have to do with Batman? Nothing really, I just kind of like fucking with people. But I also think that it's important for me to take a break from the Vicky Vale is hot and look how hot she is marathon. Alfred picks up Vicky and tells her her date with Bruce is going to be at the circus, whatever. At the circus, Bruce and Vicky take their seats while Dick is performing his trapeze act with his family. But he slips and begins to fall to earth. Bruce tells Vicky to shut the fuck up and stop panicking, because he takes notice that even while soaring towards soil, Dick is in control of his situation. Turns out the fall was all part of the act, and we get this page that doesn't really give us the most comforting start to a new Batman arc. This kid's amazing. Yeah, I've had my eye on him for a while. He's something alright. Yeah, this Brad is something. So why have you had your eye on him? I've got an eye for talent. It's a little weird, right? Like, just a little... Just a little weird. Like, this page definitely, definitely insinuates some pretty unsavory things about Bruce Wayne and is pretty stupid from the Batman angle because if he was already planning at this point to induct him as Robin, he's leaving some mighty tasty breadcrumbs for world-famous news reporter Vicky Vale to start gobbling up. But it's okay because... The more this guy tells me, the less I know. What doesn't help me at all is that I'm totally gone on him. I'm having a date with Bruce Wayne. Hot damn. Vicky is so crotch wet for Bruce that she's just too woman lust blinded to think about anything else. Not the worst thing I've seen in a comic so far, but already these characters are hinting to me that everyone's going to be a one note stereotype. Then again, we are only 13 pages in, so let's hold out hope. Maybe it could be good. We all know what happens next. You've heard of Batman and Robin before. Robin's parents are given a rapid fire lobotomy from the end of a bullet. Bruce immediately realizes that this makes Dick an orphan, and now he's entered Batman's world world. Bruce decides to take revenge on the assassin by donning the bat suit and throwing a batarang at him mid-chase. Now hang on, pause. Pause the video. You out there probably most likely have seen a good bit of Batman stuff before, right? You can very easily and plainly deduce common elements from Batman's style of detective work between all of his different incarnations. Whether it's comedic Batman, edgy Batman, or anything in between, he has a common set of protocol he follows in pretty much every representation of the Caped Crusader. For example, he pretty much always has the Bat Computer, or some sort of high-tech, bordering right on impossibly powerful computer with all the relevant criminal databases in it. So let me ask you, the wise and knowledged Batman fan that you are, a criminal who just shot and killed two people is fleeing the scene of the crime and Batman has chased them down and hit them with a batarang. What do you think his next move's going to be? Did you guess Batman would apprehend the criminal and interrogate him on why they just randomly assassinated two circus performers? Well, you're wrong! Batman is actually, of course, going to have laced his batarang with snake venom, which is incorrectly called snake poison by the world's greatest detective, so when it hits the gunman, he'll have vivid hallucinations for months straight, making him a near catatonic mess who is utterly uninterrogatable. So then you think, oh, well, that's fine. Batman can just take out the assassin and then identify who he is and work his way up the crime ladder with all the information that he has. But the problem is the gunman is world-renowned hitman Jocko Boy Vanzetti, which would normally give someone a clue as to who gave the order and who he works for. But Batman comments that Vanzetti specifically works for the highest bidder, meaning Meaning Batman now has no leads whatsoever, and the primary source of all this violence is currently twitching on the ground with his eyes rolling in the back of his head.
Whoo, okay, all right, okay, sorry, I got a little agitated there, just a little bit. I've been taking baby aspirin every day for years, and I don't have any blood left. Maybe I'm jumping the gun a bit here, uh, pun intended. Maybe Batman's immediate reaction to the shooting being to poison his only lead to make him suffer is... Well, yeah, it's on Batman and pretty stupid, but Batman can have emotional outbursts, especially when it's related to dead parents. And the dude is definitely known for having an anger issue, but he is also very smart. And the reputation this comic has is definitely clouding my judgment. If I saw this in a different book, I'd probably assume the writers just wanted to give the readers a, yeah, take that moment of triumph. But when stuff like this happens in All-Star Batman, I know this is going to be par for the course and things things are just gonna get worse. Dick is taken very hard into police custody because of course that would happen. But Vicky Vale, world famous reporter and Bruce Wayne dick rider, doesn't trust the Gotham PD to treat him well. So she tries to attend to the boy herself. This results in a cop smacking her in the jaw with a nightstick, which she, in most iterations of Batman, a civilian with no combat experience, shrugs off and uses as motivation to get even more pissed. Like I said before, this comic gets real stupid real quick, and I can't believe I don't even get to take a break for a second because now I have to explain another stupid point that's gonna happen, and this one doesn't even have an explanation. Alfred shows up to give Miss Vale a ride, but she commandeers the car to follow the cop car with Dick in it because she suspects that the cops are going to, and I quote, beat the living crap out of that boy. It's really sloppily told, but the only logic I can ascertain here is that the cops are being paid off by the people people who killed Dick's parents, and everyone knows about this. Meanwhile, Batman continues to monologue to himself as an excitable fourth grader would. I knew these cops would take the boy to the gulch, so I set up my Sonics. Bats like Sonics. They like them a lot. The crooked cops flee, and Batman, now that the crime scene is completely clear of any hostiles, rams the Batmobile into the car with Alfred and Vicky in it for the sole purpose of making a badass entrance. Whereupon, he then hoists Dick up by the collar and convinces him to join his crime-fighting force through sheer intimidation. Okay, let's recap a little bit. That was issue one. About... 20 pages of exposition, a comic made to explicitly retell the origin story of Robin, aka Dick Grayson, and act as a soft reboot introduction to an experienced, fully operational Batman. In just one issue, Batman, the character we are supposed to see as an effective leader and operator of the greater good, bungles an interrogation just to poison a wanted criminal out of petty revenge, smashes a vehicle the size of an armored personnel carrier into a passenger car containing two of his allies and tries to persuade a traumatized 12-year-old boy into joining his arsenal through sheer militaristic intimidation tactics. In just one issue. We have nine more to go. Holy shit. Issue two. Let's just read the intro to set the tone, shall we? From up here, Gotham City is beautiful. Beautiful, like Edgar Allan Poe's sweet Lenore, before her small cough brought a spot of blood to her lip, and the poet knew she was plagued, doomed. There's no sign of the dry rot that eats at the bones of my city, not from up here. I've just kidnapped a traumatized youngster. Strong boy. For his age, he's damn strong. Dick Grayson, aerialist. Twelve years old. Brave boy. Damn strong. Not that he's got a prayer of escaping my grip, but he's strong. Very promising. He just might do. He just might. I gotta move on, man. I just have to move on. There's just so much to dissect on every single fucking page, because every single fucking page has something stupid. Let's be positive. Let's say something to lower my blood pressure a bit. The artwork is fantastic, especially on this page. Take me off the screen just so people can look at this page. Look how Batman's reflected in Dick's pupils, and the color work is phenomenal. I don't, during this review, want to take away any credit from penciler Jim Lee, inker Scott Williams, and colorist Alex Sinclair. They fucking killed it in these books. Everyone else should feel bad for working on this. Yes, even the original Batman creators Bill Finger and Bob Kane, you guys should have known this book would have been created 66 years 
in the future, and you should have just stopped the whole franchise in the 80s. Oh, hey, you remember how Batman crashed a fucking tank into a car earlier? Well, Vicky's now got a shattered collarbone from a 100% pointless collision, and Alfred uses his combat medic training to stitch her up until paramedics arrive. While in triage, Vicky flashes back to everything she's seen that night until she remembers the shocking truth. Batman, Batman kidnapped that boy. Why? Why is Batman so stupid? He's just making it more and more obvious with everything that he does that his new suddenly appearing out of nowhere sidekick Robin is Dick Grayson whenever that eventually happens. More importantly, God damn, Alfred is ripped as a fucking 60-something-year-old man. These next pages are the ones you've been waiting for. These next three pages, which I am just going to read verbatim, are the entire reason I have wanted to review this comic series for literal decades. I have known about All-Star Batman ever since its initial publication back in 2005, and I read bits and pieces here and there throughout my years, but these next moments have been in the back of my mind ever since I started this YouTube channel. I knew it was my destiny to one day show this to an audience of millions of people, and now I couldn't be more proud to do so. Maybe you've read these pages while surfing the internet yourself, seen them in comic book review videos or Batman meme channels or just floating around on social media as a Batman shit post. It doesn't matter how you found it. What does matter is that I'm about to read these and they are incredible regardless of context and how we got here and we're going to do it together. I now present to you the dumbest thing Batman has ever said. Ever. Welcome to my world, Dick Grayson. Bats and rats and warts and all. You poor boy. You poor little bastard. Welcome to hell. Hell or the next best thing. The gas calms him down in the space of seconds. He won't be having any nightmares. Not the kind that aren't true, anyway. Then he starts fussing. Sleep, kid. Who the hell are you? The gas was supposed to knock him out. His brain ought to be sailing past the moon right now. What's this brat made out of? Sleep. The world I'm gonna wake you up to will be no better than the world you already know. But it'll make a whole lot more sense than the one that did. Once I've put you through holy hell, it will. It'll make sense. A lot of sense. Holy hell or the next best thing. He's faking it. So sleep tight, punk. Sleep tight, my ward. What's that? What the hell's a ward? Shut up. I'll do the talking here. Who the hell are you anyway, giving out orders like this? What are you, dense? Are you <laughs> or something? Who the hell do you think I am? I'm the goddamn Batman! Pages like this belong in a museum. We've got the snowflake rainbow explosion, the Mr. Freeze explaining that no gamer can stop him, uh, uh, Superman hand shaking hands with Jared from Subway, Mephisto asking for Spider-Man's marriage. I don't care. Put this as the main showpiece of the entire gallery of stupid comic book moments. You all out there probably have your opinions on these pages, and I know every one of you, as a distinguished gentleman or lady of exquisite taste, agree with me that they're dog shit. And for a while, I actually kind of struggled on how to explain why, other than the face value stuff. I mean, it's obvious the pages are bad. They're laughably out of character, unnecessarily dramatic, and covered in inappropriately violent subtext, but there's just something here that's like... Ugh... You know? It's rare that something, especially as innocuous as a comic book, leaves me at a loss for words, but here we are. There's just an energy to the whole thing that's just... slimy. To me, the biggest issue with this whole mess is how incredibly hard it's trying. These 30 or so pages have felt like the author has expected this work to rival Shakespeare. This whole novel of childish Batman and his stupid friends bleeds off the pages with immature short-sightedness and downright hysterical manufactured tension. It's an embarrassing atmosphere of what shouldn't be taken seriously wrapped up in a blanket of melodrama. It's the product of when sincerity meets oblivion. It can only be described by one word that I 
do think is way, way too overused on the internet, but when it comes from me, it holds all the power and weight of God sinking the city of Sodom. It's cringe. All-Star Batman and Robin is cringe. Eight and a half more issues to go! Someone on the Crooked Cops team pulls out a kill order for Batman, and his reaction is... Cool. Yeah, okay, sure. Batman decides now's the perfect time to be a gigantic asshole again, and he pulls some stunt car driving moves while screaming at Dick, Hey, dude, check this out, aren't I fucking cool? I also just want to remind everyone that Dick's parents died like 30 minutes ago. Yep. Anyway, you're out of your mind. You're nuts. Nuts? You want to see nuts, kid? I'll show you nuts. After Batman awkwardly unzips his pants, he continues to fuck around with Dick, culminating in flying away in the Batmobile transformed into the Batwing, presumably killing like five cops in the process because Batman's never had a thing about killing in his 80 plus years of adventuring. Dick Grayson, being an absolute stupid moron, begins to finally grieve over the loss of his parents, and Batman appropriately backs him across the face for it. Batman foolishly begins to maybe feel some sort of regret over what he's doing, but he psychs himself out of that sort of talk by reminding himself that nothing matters except the mission. The downright cheesy, eye-rolling inner monologues continue, and by that I mean they never stopped at any point, because it's the writer's cheap attempt at adding emotional weight. Before Batman explains what in the hell is going on, which first boils down to what the NWA more eloquently explained to us back in 1988. Fuck the police. And then Batman's all like, anywho, now that that's done, I'm fighting crime in Gotham because Gotham fucking sucks, do you want to help? And Dick, despite this PTSD soup that he's had to swim in and drink up all night, says, Yes, sir. This comic book baby should have been thrown out with the bathwater, and the only infantile saving grace is that it's directly tied to Batman. Besides the fact that I expected hot diarrhea art and instead got something astounding, I could easily see this immediately being discarded into the who cares bin and becoming a classic just for people who like following bad media. More like the room, but, you know, less Rocky Horror Picture Show. Not from endearment, but from laughing at. A classic for entirely unwholesome reasons. I mean, fuck, man, I forgot how bad this really is from what I remember of it. I remembered it was bad, and I distinctly remember some standout moments from it, but it is just really really sinking in how terrible this is on every conceivable level of the written prose. God, I need a drink. A drink of pure delicious H2O, that is. I know that when my blood turns into black bile from pure seething rage and my insides twist into balloon dog style knots from all of the memory repressing that I'm doing, I don't want to pollute my system any further with all sorts of miscellaneous crap. I just want some crystal clear water. And that's why I drink Air Up with its extremely shiny bottle that I'm going to show to you on camera even though the lights are basically going to solar flare you out of oblivion. Air Up's proprietary water bottle flavors water through your sense of smell. Smell and taste have an incredibly strong link, almost as strong as peanut butter and... Um... Um... You get the point. Air up system is so easy, even a kangaroo rat could figure it out. A kangaroo rat is a small rodent who lives in the desert and gets their water almost entirely from the seeds that they eat. Now that bit of trivia is almost as interesting as the air up water system. Just pick your scent pod. For this video, I'll be using peach, because whenever I visit your mother, I could eat a peach for hours. Put the pod on the bottle then lift it up to activate the flavor, and slurp away. Since I know you all love watching me drink so much, you'll love clicking the link in the description to get one of the limited edition bundles, perfect for holiday gift giving and to save up to 30% off. The holiday season is almost here, and it's the perfect gift for your family and friends to get flavor blasted right in the brain thanks to a catapult of delicious sensory overload. Air Up is a delightful way to stay hydrated and makes the perfect holiday gift, and it's unlike any other water bottle ever made before, at least until the year 2099, when the world's first steam-powered water bottle will be invented. Click the link in the description to get one of the limited edition bundles perfect for holiday gift giving and to save up to 30% off. Air up, breathe deep, and suck up some flavor. Anyway, 
Issue 3. We now jump across town to a seedy bar where Black Canary, another crime fighter in Gotham, is bartending for some reason. I'll tell you why she's bartending, it's so we can get way too many fucking pages of men catcalling her in the bar so we can really play up the fact that Gotham is full of horny men with big wieners. Now the one that makes me laugh though on these pages is the incredibly poorly aged catcall of Tweet for me, honey baby. See, in my mind, I immediately registered that as this guy is lusting so hard that he wants Black Canary to hop on her computer, log into Twitter, and post how much dick she can swallow and unbirth all in the eloquency that 280 characters can allow. After a scene that goes on for way too long, featuring a ton of repetition of the same phrases in the Shakespearean line of, she's got the mouth, damn she's got the mouth, Black Canary kicks a dude in the face for trying to grab her ass. She then extends this justified punishment into ass whooping a large handful of patrons in a bar for catcalling her and I'm gonna assume a good handful of them didn't do anything wrong at all. But it's entirely justified, entirely within her right, and I stood the fuck up and clapped when I saw this part because I knew this independent woman who don't need no man had a great reason for doing all of this. And it turns out that reason is a single solitary man who's got her thinking all different despite having never met her. Okay. I too am a single solitary man who started a trend of thinking differently because I used to think that this comic, although poorly executed, knew how to construct a coherent narrative. But now we've spent literally half of issue three on a worthless set of pages propagandizing nothing more than an out of nowhere female empowerment fantasy. What the hell does this have to do with Batman? Oh, wait, 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 hang on. Black Canary has to force feed a man his wedding ring real quick. What the hell does this have to do with Batman? The only thing that's happened is Batman's sheer existence is what caused Big Titty Bartender to break bones in her tavern of barbiturates. We now have a whopping 25% left of issue 3 to wrap everything up, and I think it's Stan Lee's ghost reaching out from the on the grave to play one last prank on DC Comics by making prolific comic book reviewers such as myself witness these next pages. Because out of context, they're just hysterical. I've kidnapped a traumatized youngster and drafted him into my holy war. I chose him with care. I did my homework. Dick Grayson, age 12, aerialist, the best I've ever seen. Top of his class in just about every school his roving circus life took him to. Made black belt a few weeks before he turned nine. He's got the chops. If any kid his age could have them. If. Aqualung. Very good, sir. Aqualung? What the hell are you talking about? Excuse me? We're going straight down? I mean, like, we're aimed right at the ground. Like, instant death. I hope to hell I know what I'm doing. I chortled when I read these pages. It was ugly laughter at its finest. I sounded like a hyena who swallowed some bagpipes. Even for the time period, running alongside Batman Begins and the upcoming Dark Knight, two Batman movies that helped popularize a shift toward darker, edgier blockbusters, these scripts feel like an out-of-control freight train of ideas. Each page of All-Star Batman and Robin is like someone found a way to load chaos into an AK-47 and rapid-fired it into a Fast and the Furious movie directed by a meth addict. There's just always, at all times, something high-octane stupid happening. I hate it, but I do love it. I, I always wrap back around hating it, but I love it, but I still hate it. This isn't, say, Mad Max or John Wick, where being grandiose is the flavor atop meaningful character actions and plots. This is a 12-year-old boy's art class journal in a Batman costume. You still haven't told me what a ward is. Shut up. So what do you call this thing, anyway? The Batmobile. That is totally queer. Shut up. Do I even have to say anything at this point? Fuck. Okay, yeah, I do. Do you remember how I said that Batman abducting Dick Grayson in the most obvious way possible is just gonna come and bite him in the ass? Well, now it's front page news of the Daily Planet. Gee, when Batman shows up later with a new Boy Wonder sidekick, I wonder who the fuck it could be. Also, this really pisses off Superman for some reason. Issue four. Vicky Vale's dying in the hospital. It's brutal and horrifying. Anyway, back to smiling Batman. They recycle the, uh, Earth to Batman, we're about to go splat joke, and Batman does his bid in environmental conservation as he recycles his routine of being a needless asshole. Now comes the part where you're supposed to sympathize with Batman's decision. He says he would have recruited Dick years in the future when he was a true man, but the fact his parents were killed that night made him operate way ahead of schedule, since him being at the circus makes him responsible for Dick's parents' death. Don't you feel sorry for Batman now? What do you mean, no? 
Hmm, that's weird. I I couldn't possibly understand why. Oh, wait, we missed one. Batman immediately tells Dick to shut up again on the next page. This comic's gonna snap my cerebellum. This page right after that is a glorious, incredible shot of the Batcave. This book is so all over the place, you may as well make it star Carmen San Diego. And now, as quick as he can before the FBI raids his house to confiscate his hard drives, Batman gets into a dick measuring contest with a 12-year-old boy. Pretty cool, huh? What do you say, Junior? Is this cool or what? Yeah, I guess it's okay. I mean, I've seen better, but I don't think I like this kid. Not one bit. He didn't like my bat cave. Oh, I fucking put so much work into it. He's a no good meanie. I'm gonna tell the teacher on him. I've got such cool stuff in my bat cave. I've got a big penny. I've got a butler. I've got an Xbox and a PlayStation. But Dick doesn't like it. He's a jerk. Boop, 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 boop. Shut up. There must have been a memo flying around the DC offices in 2005. I was not aware that Batman was going to be given a new signature catchphrase. Cosplayers across the world from this point are going to don the cape and cowl at their local Comic Con, and when asked if their picture can be taken, they'll respond with the Dark Knight's signature catchphrase. Shut up. Alfred calls Batman to inform him that Miss Vale's condition is looking bleak and her chest cavity has been completely shattered. Which leads to my favorite part of every video that I always do! Batman trivia! I've been doing it for years. Every video, every single one, it's got Batman trivia. If you were a billionaire with an entire dedicated R&D department, a genius level IQ, and an Olympic athlete level of fitness, what would you do in this situation? Is it A? Feel remorse that throughout your carelessness and disrespect for your position, you crippled an ally who in all likelihood will not survive. You do everything you can to help her in her time of need, and use it as a good teaching lesson for your new partner that this job is dangerous. B. Utilize your godlike potential and create a better plan that prevents you from boneheadedly smashing your civilian tank into one of your only loyal friends and a reporter who can make this scandal international news, thus nullifying this scenario from ever happening. Or C. Yell at your most trusted ally to immediately get a world-class heart surgeon in from Paris and act like that solves everything somehow. When he says he'll never make it in time, push the blame of Vicky Vale's death onto Superman if he's too busy to help you. If you chose OC, congratulations! You've been paying attention to All-Star Batman, and we're very proud of you. At this point in Batman canon, Batman and Superman aren't allies, and Batman has figured out that Superman is Clark Kent. Information which he uses to piss off Superman for seemingly no reason. So now we have an explanation as to why Superman was so upset at Batman kidnapping a child earlier, and that explanation is... There is no explanation. Jesus. Jesus fucking Christ. Finally, for the first time in about 50 pages, a moment of calm washes over the scene, which Batman uses as his way to reminisce about his mom having rockin' tits. No, I'm half kidding. Dick says he wants somewhere to change and wash the blood off his clothes, and Batman uses it to remember how his parents bled on him when he died. This may be overthinking deep into the comic book Illuminati conspiracy town, but I kind of want to believe that the writers put that line in there about Bruce's mom's breast so that they could cram another iota of sexual content into this series. Maybe not, but with how crass and blatantly fucked up this comic run is, I would not be surprised if that were the truth. But enough emotions. Those things are for women. Batman composes himself and goes to work, leaving Dick to ask the same question the audience does. What the fuck is he supposed to do now? Batman suggests taking a shower. Dick is told to spend the night in the cave eating rats and bats, and finally manages to fall asleep in between crying and freezing to death. Somehow, this doesn't convince Dick to respect Batman, and confusingly just makes him hate Batman even more. That's so weird. And then, incredibly, Superman says a bad word while running a car across the ocean! He could have just grabbed the dude and flew him to Gotham, which would have been way, way, way faster, but whatever. Batman beats up the crooked cop and finds out the scoop on Jocko Boy, the hitman who killed Dick's parents. Turns out the entire system is rigged to get him to walk due to lack of evidence, which... Huh? What the fuck do you care, Batman?
No, seriously, that doesn't matter at all. Number one, you specifically said in the first issue, Jocko Boy is a hired gun who works for the highest bidder. Why does it matter if his trial's rigged? It, certainly, yes, in general, Batman would take issue with something like that. But this entire mystery so far is why he killed Dick's parents. You're not going to ask the cop who he's working for or anything of consequence? Number two, you turning the guy's brain into an absolute soup is a gross misuse of force and abuse of due process. Him getting out of jail wouldn't even pose a significant problem, even if he was the criminal mastermind at the top. Let's say you did circumvent your no-killing law and lobotomized a supervillain like Bane. I don't think he'd be much of a tactician enemy anymore. And number three, how is this info remotely helpful? Are you planning to ambush him once he's out of police custody? Why are you getting info on a guy you intentionally let get away because you dismissed him as insignificant and you already knew exactly who he is? These are strangely specific problems to deal with that you caused, Batman. This series is great at making Batman look like a child, a terrorist, a psychopath, and a douchebag. Bag, but now it's succeeding in making him look downright stupid. That takes commitment. Props to you, All-Star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder. You fucked up so hard that you're now inventing your own category of garbage. Dick wakes up in the cave and notices somebody has taken care of him while passed out. There's some fast food on a tray for him, he's been wrapped up in a blanket, and he's now wearing some pajamas insinuating whoever did it to him either saw or got uncomfortably close to Dick's dick. It was Alfred, of course, because contrary to everything this book wants to establish in its characters, humanity has evolved to feel empty and a few rare few are destined to pass that trait along to the next generation. Alfred is one in a million, which means Batman has to throw another temper tantrum because that's not how I did it, Alfred! <laughs> Alfred rightfully tells Batman to calm the fuck down, and Batman remarks how, somehow, Dick not being tortured into being a superhero will ruin his ability to fight crime forever. And here it is. This right here is the moment all the pieces fall together. I now get it. The big old aha light bulb flipped on on my head and i'm sure a lot of you figured this out emotionally but haven't put the idea into concrete thoughts yet so let me spell out for you how catastrophic this comic has finally become the only moment of catharsis in this entire comic has been alfred telling batman to tone it the fuck down. Batman is the bad guy, and a real bad one at that. I don't sympathize with his plight, I don't see his actions as the greater good, and I sure as shit am not excited to see where he's going with all this. I feel bad for Dick, I feel worse for Vicky Vale, and I'm rooting for Alfred. You can write some very compelling stories by questioning the morality of Batman, especially when viewing his place among leagues of literal god figures as a man on a citywide scale revenge quest. But this comic doesn't do that. It doesn't even remotely feel like it's trying to do that. This comic wanted to make Batman tough and intimidating and willing to make the hard choices to get the job done, but instead it makes him unlikable, overly brutal, and too impulsive to qualify to do any of this. It takes that package and wraps it all up in a story that takes place before he's won over the hearts and minds of Gotham and his fellow do-gooders. What you get when you do that is you've created a character that no matter what he's doing is going to come off as in the wrong and fighting for no reason. In other words, fuck this guy. Issue fucking five and look at this cover and tell me my analysis is wrong, I dare you. And now it's time to sharpen another character, because the most prominent thing that this comic and the machete I'm gonna cut my own head off with have in common is that they are both edgy. Wonder Woman's here, and her hobbies include complaining about men in eight separate text boxes, and calling one who's obviously innocently afraid of her a sperm bank. Yeah, like a superhero would. If I was a plucky young little lady reading Batman for the first time, I'd certainly continue reading knowing the only two female superheroes showcased so far are an emotional emotionally unstable violence addict who's set off by a man, and a woman whose entire introductory page is spent talking about men. Women. They're secretly always just thinking about men. And goddammit, I was kidding, but the next page is Wonder Woman bitching about how much she hates Batman, so let's just skip it. Turns out there's a secret meeting of Wonder Woman, Superman, Green Lantern, and Plastic Man, and they're all there to discuss how much of a problem Batman and his radical methods are to their image and line of work. 
And this plot is just so, so fucking stupid because all it would take to stop them is Wonder Woman or Superman flying to Gotham, waiting for him to show up and punching a hole through his chest. The end. Have you seen how out in the open he's operating? He did donuts in the fucking swamp parking lot for an hour just to scare a child. This is child's play for you guys to have handled by now. They all argue about how stupid this all is and Superman steals Batman's signature catchphrase of shut up. All I got for this one is... I mean, Batman saying shut up I can see, especially when he's trying to intimidate. I can also see Superman saying damn when he's panicked or stretched thin, but Superman saying shut up just feels so... so... This is an official DC written product, and they don't even understand their flagship characters. It's really ignominious. Wonder Woman is still new to the Earth realm during this time frame. She suggests that the Justice League cut Batman's head off to show that they don't fuck around when it comes to rogue superheroes, which you would think is an appropriate punishment for Omega Eugenics Man, the universe's most evil dictator, and not an appropriate punishment for a rogue agent with questionable methods, but hey, you do you, role model superhero from a team made of shining beacons for all humanity? Now it's Superman's turn to yell like a super child, and he uses his super breath to super scold Diana like a Pokemon trainer who caught his growlet shitting on the carpet. Diana responds with a classic, you bastard, I hate your guts, and then the two promptly slap fight each other while saying, you stop it, no, no you stop it, no, mm -mm, you stop it, mm -mm. no, uh-uh, you, oh, uh, you started it, I'm telling mom, well, I'm telling dad, until Plastic Man stretches in and says, okay, you two, that's enough, we're supposed to be a team, now kiss and make up, and then they start making out, and Wonder Woman says, oh, I'm sorry, I love you, Superman, and Superman says, oh, no, I'm sorry, I love you, Wonder Woman, and then Wonder Woman's like, mm, kiss me, mm -hmm. And then Superman's all like, oh yeah, Diana, kiss me good. And then they... Okay, no, I'm just kidding around. Except I'm not fucking kidding! This comic was written by a fifth grader. That's all the evidence I need, baby! Oh, hey! Wonder Woman steals Batman's signature catchphrase of shut up, and the narrator can't help but remind the audience that one day these fine fucks will form the Justice League. But that can't happen until Batman plays ball. Why at any point Superman didn't fly in and speak to Batman well before any of this happened is another question I'm going to put directly on the pile of reasons this story can be directly linked to the 2008 housing crisis, and we'll discuss it another time. But for now, I have to read page nine. Ha 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 ha! I love being the goddamn Batman. <laughs> I want you to imagine that your parents have been violently killed in front of your eyes. Imagine you've dedicated your entire life to righting the wrongs that brought your childhood to a screeching halt. I want you to come up with whatever scenario you can that would logically get you over that to the point that you'd be giggling about it all like a school child. And no, this panel's not another psychological dick torture or fake out or anything. He's running across rooftops just working himself up over how cool he is. We've gone beyond beating a dead horse and now we're dining on its delicious horse steaks, but I just want to say this point again. This writing is way off when it comes to any level of poignancy and depth. Think how much untapped potential this story has while working with a largely nuanced character like Batman. The angle of mental damage and scars on him has been explored before and you could so, so very easily do that here. Batman is torturing Dick and acting like this because he still hasn't fully processed the trauma of his parents' demise. There you go. Alfred could explain his objections beyond stop making the 12 year old eat rats and grow them into harsh reality checks and emotional reinsurances by saying, Doing this isn't going to bring back your parents, Master Wayne. The writers think Batman is cool, so they want Batman to tell us that he knows he's cool. So that way all this unnecessary violence and brutality is somehow justified. Batman can be written for 14 year old boys, but he shouldn't act just like them. It's even punctuated with this out of nowhere full page spread of a nice convenient hero pose Batman. I used to have objections to this guy operating with almost identical 
identical conduct to that of the Joker. But now that I know he's having a good time, I'm cool with it. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I wrote that line just before reading the next page. And when I said Batman is operating with conduct identical to the Joker, I was fucking kidding. But you want to know what happens next? Do you want to know what happens on the very next page? Batman leaps off the building to detain some thugs mid-mugging, and he startles them by laughing at them the entire time that he's falling. Stealth is a vital part of Batman's arsenal. Batman does what Batman does, snapping one of the thug's arms in the process. My arm, my hand! Why can't I feel my hand? Oh my god! Why can't I feel my hand? It's called a compound fracture, rapist. It'll never heal. Not right it won't. Not nearly right. You'll remember me every time the air goes wet and cold. Arthritis, punk. It'll hurt like hell. I actually like this panel. It's, of course, absolutely vicious, but this is the first time the entire comic book feels in character for Batman. It's arguably over the top, but in this story where we're not afraid of violence, the line's actually pretty fucking good. Give one point to All-Star Batman and Robin, which will put its current score at negative 216. Batman continues to beat on the goons, and the woman he just saved, who by all normal human accounts should be utterly terrified, begins to instead have an orgasm. Good girl. You go home now. Catch your cab on Novik. It's well lit. Call your shrink if you've got one. But don't call any cops about all this. They're useless. They're worse than useless. Yes, sir. Thank you. I love you. Nobody loves anybody, my darling. We just survive. Fuck me, Batman, don't call the woman a good girl. That's just as creepy as the dudes who wanted to assault her. And woman, you call these men an ambulance. Batman has no fucking idea whether or not those concussive head wounds he just inflicted will turn fatal. And comic writers, if I ever see you use the phrase, nobody loves anybody, my darling, we just survive ever again, normally I'd threaten to beat you with my shoe, but you guys seem to get off on violence, so I'm gonna smother you in kisses instead like a cute golden retriever puppy. And I warn you, I'm a great kisser. <laughs> Time for me to shake my head in disappointment again, because the next page contains an image I've seen many times before. It's one of my all-time favorite Batman illustrations and a commonly used key art piece for him as well. Here it is in the Batman card from the DC deck building game. I'm ashamed to see it in context because out of context, it's a fucking gorgeous piece of art. In context, it's some glitters sprinkled on a turd pile. Batman then proceeds to think storms are cool, and this whole issue besides meeting the Justice League has entirely been filler, including Dick finding a battle axe in the Batcave, which is so radical it makes him forget that his parents died only 12 hours ago, so let's skip it. Issue 6, and I hate how long this is taking. Behold, Barbara Brooke Gordon, age 15, will now be joining the story. Things may get a little confusing because Gordon's wife and his daughter are both named Barbara, so for simplicity we will call his daughter Batgirl, since that's who she's going to become. And since she's a woman, I don't even want to begin to describe what I think is going to happen to her knowing the tone of this story. Batgirl eavesdrops on her dad's phone call, which the book makes sure to point out is with a woman he'll likely cheat on his wife with, which is blindingly inconsistent? Earlier in the story, Batman specifically hints that Jim Gordon is the only trustworthy cop in Gotham. Now we need to know, for seemingly no reason other than to cast shade on him, that Gordon chats regularly with a woman he'd rather be banging than his wife. Cool, dude. Good job making every character unlikable. And good job again contradicting yourself by labeling him a good cop in his introductory panel. Excuse me, I have to go vent my anger. The scales of justice are always known to be balanced, and that applies to the justice readers deserve when consuming good writing. Tipping the scale towards the shitty end, we've got swearing now, which I'm surprised didn't start with issue one, but it's going to be very, very relevant later. You should get excited for this plot twist, folks. I'm gonna see you in issue 10. But for now, we've gotta call out another part that I like, finally bringing a second smile to my face while reading this canker sore of a comic book. Yeah, this Batman, the media's having a field day. All that stuff about that kid he's supposed to have kidnapped. First off, I'm not buying that. I don't believe he'd do anything of the sort. 
I've got a whole different problem with the goddamn Batman. I'm a sucker for a good callback, and the goddamn Batman callback here is good. I'll even ignore the fact that regardless of his intentions, Batman totally 100% did kidnap Dick. Sure, he saved him from police brutality, but he's explicitly holding him hostage in the Batcave, so, you know, whatever, Batman's so cool. God, I love when Batman himself commits crimes. And that's because I myself am about to break the law, because I'm normally illegally forbidden from reading page 7 of this issue due to a self place restraining order because it overuses the cute goddamn Batman callback by shoehorning it in three more times in one page. Oh, also Batgirl's a secret Batman fanatic and made herself a custom bat suit and says the word shit again and then goes out to fight crime. Good for her. I was beginning to get too close to drinking the bleach in my laundry room, so it's nice to see something actually fun and uplifting in all-star Batman and Robin for a change. Jimmy Olsen's introduced and he races to the hospital to deliver some requested information information to Vicky Vale. And there's a cute gag with his gift of flowers being totally overshadowed by Bruce Wayne's gift of flowers, and I'm gonna ignore it because I don't at all trust this comic when two good things happen back to back. Vicky's probably gonna snap Jimmy's neck and leave the hospital disguised in his skin or something. Point is, Jimmy being a journalist for a major newspaper means he's able to download extensive files on the Flying Graysons, Dick Grayson, and Batman, and now Vicky Vale has that scoop in her back pocket. Meanwhile, at the docks... Black Canary is looking for a seller of stolen goods. We establish this within half a page, but then spend two more pages doing the thing we already did previous with Black Canary. Flipping the fuck out, being hit on, and then using it as an excuse to hit the spinal cords of every man in the immediate vicinity. Then we flash back to five minutes ago. Batman's also at the docks because he's waiting to ambush Jocko Boy, the assassin of Dick's parents from a few issues ago. And again, if Batman actually wasn't an immature jackass, he would have gotten the info he needed days ago, but I'm not not gonna get too angry about it because this scene gives us this incredible line. A guy like Jocko Boy Vanzetti always makes me want to get some crippling done. God, I wish that line was in the Arkham games. I mean, just once I want to hear the late great Kevin Conroy say that iconic Batman line. That always makes me want to get some crippling done. That is kind of a funny coincidence. The only place I've seen Batman act like more of a clueless buffoon than this is in the Arkham games. In fact, the dumbest I've ever seen Batman is when I played Arkham Asylum for my new gaming channel, Hugby's Gamer Mode, which I'll go ahead and link in the description. Here's a funny clip from me and my pals playing Arkham Asylum that'll make you want to watch the rest of the entire channel. So it's like you can poke in different directions and... <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, once Hugbees finishes his blatant, obnoxious self-promotion, Batman does his dumb-as-fuck laughing routine again, followed by a quip that if sprung it from the mouth of 60s Batman would be stirring and exciting. But here it's just so gosh dang lame. Uh, excuse me, goddamn lame. I have to keep with the running joke in the book. Blag! Blag? What's with Blag? I'll give you some talking to do, Jocko boy. What reaction was expected here? Did the DC bigwigs expect the readers to stand up and cheer and give a rounding rouse of applause for Batman childishly mocking a criminal? Also, for some reason, this part had to be told out of order, so now we can flash back to the present of Black Canary fighting some men. There's no dramatic tension or storytelling elements added at all by having the Batman scene be a flashback, so just keep in mind that the writers are throwing darts at the elements of storytelling guide sheet and using that as inspiration for how to change things up. Batman comes in to rescue her so he can come in her for the rescue later. The goddamn Batman line is now being so reused that I have a feeling it's a big meta inside joke by this point, which ruins all the fun that the line had without taking away from how awkwardly terrible it is. The end. Issue 7. Batman's plan for assaulting a group of armed criminals is to do his frankly attention-grabbing laugh routine while kicking one in the face. No smoke bomb, no weapon disarming, no stealth takedowns one by one, just a kick and him going ha 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 so well that all the other baddies cower in immediate and paralyzing fear. Which cascades into the most confusing line of the entire story, and probably the most confusing line I've heard in a comic book. I even googled this specific sentence to see if I'm missing some turn of phrase here. I don't know if it's a typo or if this is what it's supposed to be. Batman screams, you don't know from screwed, you losers. What does that mean? This isn't engagement baiting, I'm serious. Please let me know in the comments if you have any fucking idea what this phrase means, because I certainly don't. 
I don't even know what the phrase could mean if it's a typo or some 2005 version of autocorrect. The best I can piece together is he was supposed to say, you don't know you're screwed, you losers, but you're and from are in pretty different places on a keyboard and conceptually they seem like hard words to confuse with each other. Oh my god, Jesus Christ, I just realized I've become so used to this comic's laughable dialogue I'm ignoring the fact that Batman is yelling playground insults at his prey in another bid to prove that he's not Batman, he's just Spider-Man wearing the cowl. Batman notices the gang is now afraid and shooting haphazardly all over the place. They hit a shipping container of bleach bottles which gives Batman an incredible idea. They're shooting scared. They're shooting stupid, killing their own. Life is good. Let me take you to school, suckers. In chemistry. It hurts! You don't know from hurt either, you wads. Oh my god! And so's this boy of mine. Black Canary, witnessing people having bones forced out of their skin and people being set on fire, does the natural thing any woman would do according to this comic book written by a college fraternity. Her pussy splashes the bottom of her leotard so hard that she has no choice but to make out with Batman right the fuck now. Black Canary and Batman then proceed to have sex outside on the wet wooden dock in the middle of the freezing rain next to the unconscious bodies of mangled gangsters who are currently burning alive. Batman manages in one singular panel to most likely break his one consistent code of ethics and somehow get a full erection when his testicles must be swimming inside his body cavity from the cold. Need a ride home? In this rain, you'll freeze yourself to death on that Harley. What? You've got a car? You're the goddamn Batman, and you need yourself a goddamn car? Not one word. I've taken enough grief about calling my goddamn car the goddamn Batmobile. I'm the goddamn Batman, and I can call my goddamn car whatever the hell I want to call it. Stop! Just stop! It's not funny anymore! Let's get you home. It's almost dawn. Sometimes I hate the sun. Okay, now it's funny again. Should it ever cross your mind, if I may be so bold as to ask, does it ever occur to you that perhaps you could find some wee benefit from speaking to a person or two now and then? Of course, not while you're so busy punching somebody senseless. Shut up. All I'm trying to say is that your perspective on things might find itself a tad bit readjusted by the occasional conversation with somebody. Somebody you're not punching in the face, that is. Shut the hell up. Okay, now it's really funny again. I am always delighted to see Batman whip out his signature catchphrase and even put a little English on it. Also, hey, I'm jumping in as I'm recording this. I did not write this part of my script. I just now noticed it while reading these panels. Black Canary critiques Batman for being a loner and not talking to people and being a shut-in and not communicating and, like, doing all this shit out of his own little bubble. When... Black Canary, the entire time she's in this book, has done nothing but fight every man she's seen. I don't think she's had a conversation with a single character she didn't try to ass whoop except Batman. Why don't the writers of this comic just call the Justice League? Are they stupid? Meanwhile, back in the Batcave, Dick gets so fed up with one of his new rat roommates that he tomahawks the motherfucker in half. His guilt over having killed a literal plague-carrying pest is so great that he vomits. In walks Batman, and we finally, after all this drought, all this waiting, all this pain and sorrow, we finally get a moment that I well and truly like. And I mean really like. This may be my favorite moment so far. This upcoming piece is a pretty damn good bit of character writing. I hate that to get here I had to read the equivalent of chewing on broken glass with my brain, but luckily I know a good dentist for my mind, and it's called Good Character Moments. Grayson, front and center, I brought you the man who murdered your parents, and his fate is in your hands. You can hear me, can't you, boy? It's time for you to decide. Are you an Avenger or a detective? Yes, I hear you, sir. Thank you, sir. Give me his name. He's done a lot of things, Jocko Boy has. None of them good. These days, he's a trigger. You wouldn't know that term, it's an old one. It means if you give him money, he'll blow the brains out of anybody you'd like him to. Does he have any family? Nothing human, as far as I know. You've got a choice to make, and you have to make it now. Avenger or detective? What's it gonna be? Jocko Boy stops trying to talk. He stops breathing. Grayson makes his choice. Shunk. You little son of a bitch! You'll talk when I tell you to talk, you bastard! It's pretty good. There's, a, there's actual tension, there's... 
impressively framed panels of fake out, you know, is coming, but there's a clever execution to it. The best part of All-Star Batman and Robin is this four-page sequence right here, hands down, at least for now. This is the first time I felt like I was reading a Batman and Robin comic and not Punch Man's Violence Puberty Hour. Dick is now learning at an impressive pace, even going so far as to steal Batman's signature catchphrase. After being beaten off by a 12-year-old boy, Jocko finally confesses to who hired him, and Batman, in his classic style, gets pissed off. Now look, I know a handful of you are going to say, wow, Hugbees, you're just so unbelievably funny, I love you, but after that, you're gonna say, look, Hugbees, Batman didn't interrogate Jocko, so he could save him for Dick. There's a reason he did all that, and you missed it. To which I reply, why did Batman bother letting him go to jail in the first place if he knows all the cops are crooked and he's just gonna walk away anyway? And if he didn't know he was going to walk, why risk letting him go to jail where Batman's interrogation could never happen? Why not apprehend him alongside Dick on the night of the murder, bring them both to the Batcave, and then explain to Dick, look, Dick, this is the guy who murdered your parents. You can kill him now and get revenge, or this can be lesson one on your road to becoming a badass superhero detective like me, and then we can fight for proper justice and avenge them, and not, you know, not throw our lives away for revenge. Then you can skip all the stupid locking dick in the Batcave shit, which largely seems to amount to nothing, and then have a great emotional tense moment acting as the very first deep bond formation between Batman and Robin. Real Batman leads by example, and explains to Dick that he personally understands the trauma he's going through, and that he should always choose justice over revenge. Unfortunately, that would never happen, because it would require some level of maturity from Batman, and this isn't the real Batman, this is all-star Batman we're talking about, baby. But now, real quick, let's just tease the Joker, because no Batman story is allowed to exist without them shoehorning in the Joker to boost ratings. Issue 8 features a cover of Joker doing his absolute best Kazuma Kiryu impression. If issue 8 continues on with him fighting his way through the Dojima family to make sure he's not late to karaoke night, I will consider this my new favorite comic of all time. Episode 8 released toward the tail end of 2007, meaning by this point DC was very close to the release of The Dark Knight. They knew privately what their new direction of Joker depiction was going to be, and something tells me they mandated this comic to go after that style. Because check out this Heath Ledger looking motherfucker. Joker introduces himself by killing a high profile attorney after tricking her into a night of coitus. And then, to dispose of the body, this comic awakens me to a new Christmas morning. I want to christen this day a new international holiday, because if you thought that this out-of-nowhere wackiness was finally pulling itself together, you ain't seen nothing yet. To dispose of the body, Joker calls his newest henchman, Bruno. Now you may have noticed something very obvious about the image on your screen. I have censored Bruno's breasts. Dear viewer, this is not simply to comply with YouTube's anti-nudity policies. After all, there's no way that they'd get away with such brazen and tasteless nudity in a Batman comic, except for the time that they accidentally showed all of Bruce Wayne's penis. Oh no. I have covered Bruno's breasts because she does a sensible job of covering her own nipples. And she covers them with pasties of swastikas. That's the only time I'm gonna say that so the YouTube algorithm doesn't accidentally automatically demonetize me. But feel free to back the video up a bit and make sure that you heard me correctly. I know what I said, and you can search up the image for yourself. This comic is fucking bonkers. Since the Joker was just introduced, it's pretty unsurprising that he's the one who ordered the hit on Grayson's parents. Dick's finally eager to get some action, but Batman insists he continue to fly solo, since Dick doesn't even have a costume yet. I'm just gonna read you page nine now, because because the more I share this comic, the better I'll feel when I have to prove to my therapist that it wasn't just a vivid hallucination brought on by early dementia. So why a mask? Why in hell do I need to wear a mask? I mean, a costume is queer enough, but why a mask? So you'll have a secret identity, stupid. It's just so juvenile to me. I can't get over how juvenile of a character you have to be to be a 40-year-old man who says, So you'll have a secret identity, stupid. This isn't Batman. 
This is Tom Hanks from the movie Big after stealing a Batman costume from the Macmillan Toy Company. It's also pretty funny that Batman's whole temper tantrum is over the fact that Dick might be leaking his secret identity, but he just brought the man who killed his parents in a face-to-face -face confrontation with him, really rubbing in the, hey, this kid's probably gonna be my new sidekick. You keep in mind, Dick Grayson. If you see him, that's him. And you see, now the comic's getting smart and catching on to me, because just after I raise that point, the comic gives an answer. Secret identity? How could I have a secret identity when everyone on Earth saw you kidnap me? I mean, aren't they kind of gonna know who I am? I'll figure something out. Get to work on that costume. And what about Jocko Boy back there? You told him my name. I made sure he was too stoned to remember anything. I know what I'm doing, boy wonder. Boy wonder? Don't worry, guys. All these bunglingly obvious flaws in Batman's plan are covered because he'll figure something out. It's totally not because the writers wrote themselves into a corner and when finally confronting staggeringly obvious questions, tried to postpone finding answers for them that are bafflingly idiotic. Page 11 brings back Batman's classic shut up catchphrase, and now we zoom off to page 12, where he explains how he can't stand being around Grayson for more than five fucking seconds, foreshadowing that they'll have a long, successful, family-like partnership. Then the Green Lantern signal shines in the sky, which I didn't even know was a thing, but here we are. Oh, God. So Batman throws Jocko Boy into the harbor, who keep in mind is still bound up and will very likely drown from exhaustion. Batman fucks with him psychologically for no reason, and the book tries to get cute by pulling some meta humor on how Jocko's response is too vulgar to print. On both levels, this is dumb, because the book isn't polite enough to hold back on anything, and the writing's too amateur to treat this as other than a recycled joke from God knows how many other publications. And now we're back to the book being clever again, God damn it! I hate that every 10 steps back, we take one step forward because my role of negativity has to come to a halt to admonish genuine praise. You know how Dick's been fucking around with the weapons in the Batcave the whole time while Batman's gone? He finds a compound bow his size and imagines he's Robin Hood. This inspires him when he asks for a mask to ask for some tights to go along with them and is probably going to act as inspiration for where his name Robin will come from. It's fine, it's a cute idea for his alter ego origins, and I can't wait for this heroic coming of age moment to be robbed by Batman and dropping a hard R bomb right on the next page with his new classic catchphrase, I've got a <laughs> demigod to take care of. Batman and Green Lantern set up a meeting and who cares? Bo -bo 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 Boobs! It's been almost eight whole issues since we last saw some big fat cat tats. Catwoman's here and well, yeah, she's sexy. That's pretty consistent through line for her. But more importantly, I really like her costume in this iteration. It's cute. I got no caveat. Again, I'm, I'm trying to be fair to this comic, you know? Do you have a problem with people digging for diamonds in the rough? The Robin Hood Robin's a fun idea. Yakuza Joker's dumb, but I like Catwoman in this. It just looks fun. Joker meets up with Catwoman to propose a team up for something, and Robin tries to kill Batman when he gets back to the Batcave. Unfortunately, the villain wins in the end of this story because Batman survives. Don't call me kid. Don't call me boy. Don't call me brat. Don't call me little snot. Call me Hood. My dad was always making me watch some old movie about Robin Hood. That's why I became an archer. So call me Hood. Hood, huh? Do you know what any thug would have a brain would do with that hood? Hey! They could do the same thing with Batman's cowl, but okay, what the fuck ever. I'm just ready to get this over with, issue 9. The cavalcade of stupidity doesn't end there. You want to know why Batman set up a meeting with Green Lantern earlier instead of just talking to him right then and there? It's because Batman used his legendary detective skills properly for the first time all series and painted the secret meeting room as well as himself entirely yellow, since that's Green Lantern's weakness. They just have no idea what they're doing. If Batman needed protection from having a chat with the Green Lantern, why not show up on the rooftop painted yellow? Why show up to the rooftop at all and completely expose yourself if the plan is to have a secret meeting where you have a line of defense? You could have just as easily dropped a note to the Green Lantern or done a thousand other things instead of telling him about this in person, which is the most counterproductive means of communication possible. I actually kind of like this being Batman's plan if we're in the canon where the Justice League doesn't trust him and vice versa and they're figuring each other out. Batman is no stranger to improvisation and taking the simplest path to his goal. There's a great example of that in my Riddler comic review that I'll link in the description, but usually those moments are supposed to be comical because they expose Batman's common 
sense and lateral thinking in defeating villains that are overthinking, grandstanding, or have laughably simple weaknesses that their egos don't account for. Here, Batman's just kind of following the trend established by the series that he's a sloppy drunk of a tactician, and his execution of operations is drawn entirely from being the biggest megalomaniac possible. Also, just to make sure that we dig the grave of Batman being likable deep enough, we need a specific panel here dedicated to how he made Robin paint the entire thing himself. Let's pump the brakes here for a minute. I am one who doesn't mind breaking bread with the enemy. I've called out what I like about this comic when I see it. I want to read this next panel out loud, not because I think it's a particularly strong moment, nor does it salvage Batman's character in any way. I just think you'll like it, and you'll be able to guess why I like it. I don't think you realize how serious a situation this is, how much danger you're in. A lot of people want you brought down, or worse. You're up against some unspeakable power. Oh, I find that power plenty speakable, Hal. There's parents groups, there's the mafia, and just about every East Coast street gang. There's the civil rights contingent, the cops, the mayor, and this being an election year, Congressman Blaggard and Governor Spindle. Then there's you, and that little joy luck club you're putting together. Four of you by my count. The Wicked Witch of Lesbos Island, the last candy pants of a blown up planet, a shape changer who's fruitier than a nutcake, and you, master of the giant green egg beater when you're not plagued by a certain primary color. Care for a glass of lemonade? The verbal smackdown thrown out here by the Cape Crusader while flagrantly out of character is a masterstroke in roasting that probably hurts more than any of the bones he just broke at the docks. I also really, really like how he rubs in the yellow weakness making sure to only serve lemonade. Finally, the comic is learning what fun is and how when your character's a total bastard, you can play with that formula in a way that makes the audience enjoy it as opposed to a way that makes them shrivel up like 10 times as much as if they drank those glasses of lemonade. Batman and Green Lantern debate each other's crime fighting methods and Batman explains that he has to be violent because nothing else is going to get rid of the hardened criminals of Gotham. I don't care. I know where this is going. What I do care about is fucking look at this art, man. I can't commend Jim Lee, Scott Williams, and Alex Sinclair's work enough on the art of all-star Batman and Robin. It's so good. And the shading on detailed pages like this, working with nothing but shades of yellow, is just unparalleled. It's one of the reasons I'm having a ton of fun reading this comic, because for all of the laughably and embarrassingly bad parts of the actual meat, I have not once had a negative thing to say about the presentation. And through these golden sun panels shines the hope that the series may be turning around because we actually get fun, a concept I long thought was abandoned by the plot. Batman's provocations earn him a fierce right hook from the Green Lantern's might. As the ring bearer beats up the Caped Crusader, Robin catches the glass of lemonade before it shatters and makes sure to refill it while a regular old wailing commences. You see this here? This is called character building. Batman and Robin's current relationship is more of a begrudging summer camp attendee and counselor than anything else. So the fact Robin would care more about the glass than Batman getting his ass kicked is sensical and entertaining. It's a shame that one issue of nine so far is getting this right, but it's better than nothing, I guess. But even Hal Jordan, the dude who couldn't see why kids love Cinnamon Toast Crunch, begins to call out that Robin is totally Dick Grayson and it'd be stupid to say otherwise. And what's Batman's master plan? to cover up this totally conspicuous truth? He staged a press conference with Dick Grayson where he talked about how Batman actually saved him from corrupt cops, and now he'll be hiding in the foster care system in witness protection. Oh, yeah! Sure, Batman! People will totally buy that. The kid, all over national news in front of millions of people, and you can totally see who he is because he's just using a simple cutout domino mask to conceal his identity. No one's ever going to piece this together, ever. This somehow incredibly related plot is even dumber than what happens in the Rainbow Batman arc. I won't spoil it, I'll put my video on it as a link in the description. I'm sorry I'm self-promoting so much, I'm just really fucking good at what I do. So Batman and Robin's true plan is finally revealed. They get Green Lantern pissed off, confused, and distracted enough that Robin can pickpocket the lantern ring right off his finger. Using his acrobatics, Robin passes the ring to Batman, who pockets it in a yellow utility pouch. Mission accomplished, right? 
Well, when Hal tries to get the ring back, Robin unleashes on him in an overkill fashion, trying to collapse his throat, and Batman don't like that, no sir, not one bit. Batman beats the fuck out of 12-year-old Dick, and then jumps into emergency triage for Hal. For very little reason, Batman takes off his cowl to do this, and I guess the implication is he needs to focus and see exactly what he's doing. But isn't the whole point of Batman that his entire loadout is perfectly tailor-made to be used in any situation? Whatever. It's also the first time Robin ever gets to see Batman as Bruce Wayne, something you'd think he'd figure out by now, or... Uh, I don't know what happened in some capacity, but I don't care anymore. I'm gonna snap myself out of the way so you can look at page 17 in all its glory. Ignore the dialogue, it's impressively stupid. For some reason, Robin talks about how he loved almost killing someone, which is definitely more of a Jason Todd thing. Doesn't matter. Look at the panel art and rejoice. It's just way too good. It is wasted on this series. And the rest of the comic ends on a somber and distinctly tasteful note. Batman finally begins to legitimately question how quickly he's pushing the entire sidekick program, and drives Robin to the cemetery where his parents are buried to finally grieve. Something Batman acknowledges he was allowed to do on his journey, but never gave Dick the chance. And then issue 9 ends. There's no dumb teaser for something else stupid, there's no other bombastically moronic character interactions to drag it down, it's just... this. A light-hearted, loose end tie-up that escalates suddenly, and Tonal shifts the entire thing into a genuine moment of emotion. Issue 9 is good. It's real good, and I don't think anyone on the internet has ever mentioned this. I try to avoid watching things on topics I intend to cover because I want to form my own opinion and analysis on the things I talk about. But I do remember reading reviews and breakdowns of this comic back in the day, and I can't remember anyone taking a moment to appreciate any positives beyond the artwork. But broken clocks are right twice a day, and I'm one hell of a watchmaker. I think my biggest bout of depression when reading all this is that I have to move on to the final chapter, because if they didn't bother introducing the Joker or Batgirl, wrapped up the Vicky Vale plotline, and used issue 9 as the finale to become a launch point for a new Batman and Robin series, I would have thought this series was a stellar case of mistakes into miracles. But the problem is... I mean, I haven't read it yet, so I don't know. It might be okay, but the problem is... I'm going to assume that Chapter 10 is probably going to fucking suck, isn't it? Issue 10. The last one until we can all go home. Fun fact, the original collected edition of this series omits issue 10 entirely, so my prediction of garbage incoming seems truer by the second. We open on Gordon, who is only a captain and not a commissioner yet, and he waxes poetic about his life while explaining that one of the officers under his command found Catwoman beaten, bloody, and bruised in an alleyway. She told the cop to give a message to Batman, so the cop gives it to Gordon. Gordon decides it's not worth anyone's time trying to locate the Batman, so he tosses it away in the harbor, but it's a big fake out because Batman's waiting below the docks to intercept the message. Gordon then experiences some weird family drama that's never brought up again, so feel free to ignore it, they won't be on the test tomorrow. There's a handful of entirely pointless pages of Batman monologuing way too much as they jump on top of a subway car. They ride into a secret part of the subway tunnels where Batman built his original Batcave and fucked Catwoman doggy style against a mess of steam pipes and rat droppings. No, I'm not kidding. Catwoman's all fucked up, so they call Alfred for evac, and then the story ends. Yeah, pretty much. Well, at least we're gonna stop reading here. Oh, don't worry, I read the rest of the comic on my own, but it's pointless. No, seriously, it's completely pointless. There's just tons and tons of dialogue about Gordon's inner monologues about things, and his wife gets in a car accident, and Batgirl assaults a local carnival, beating up all the drug dealers and gangbangers who have moved in to make it their home turf, and Black Canary has like five pages of her just beating up dudes again, and it's a confusing, forgettable mess, and I don't want to bother writing anything about it. Trust me, you are not missing anything in this last issue. There's nothing more to the story after this. There's a cliffhanger, and they try to pull things together a little bit, but it all just spills out on the floor like a drop jug of milk. The Joker never shows up again. He's, he's just gone. He just fucked off back to Joker land. It's really disappointing that they tried to keep going after the end of Chapter 9, because it was the perfect way to leap into a new story bringing the plot threads with it. But instead, just like people with a balloon-popping fetish, 
we got a confusing blunder for a climax. If this was still a typical comic book review, I would have skimmed through all of it and then remarked on how it's either filler or the story's never got concluded and it's the final issue and, and you know, kind of just spun off from there. But there's something very special about issue 10 of All-Star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder. Take a look at these pages. You'll notice the wanton profanity is back. The screen is littered with sentence enhancers because the writers couldn't figure out how else to make Batgirl spunky other than to slather her dialogue in rude removals. But on issue 10's initial release, the book was entirely recalled by DC for printing errors. And those printing errors left the profanity uncensored throughout the entire comic. And I just so happen to have a copy. All right, so here is my copy of Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder. All-Star Batman and Robin Boy Wonder. And I got this on eBay in... Nice little hardcore, hard shell protectors collector's case. This is the shit that... You see to preserve this kind of stuff, you see for video games and Pokemon cards and after all these aftermarket buying, selling, trading bullshit. It's even got a 9.6, zoom in, enhance, a 9.6 quality grade. So it's in super fucking good condition. Now, what I want to point out is at the top here, it says this is a recalled variant cover. So it's like the rarest fucking printing of this comic ever. This cover, from what I researched, I think I got this factoid right, was only on 10% of all the issues made. It's a special edition cover. The rest had the regular art that you'll probably see in the review from the scans that I'm using. More importantly, it says that it is the recalled version. And that's gonna mean one of two things when I finally take a peek at this. We're going to either see that it is in fact loaded with uncensored swear words, or I have been scammed by the third-party seller market in a whole big fucking hoopla that's going down right now. Another key note is that when this comic retailed, I don't know if you can see it, it went for $2.99. Thanks to the third-party collector's market, I paid $140 for this. My $140 collectible comic book. And this is a $15 sledgehammer I got on Amazon. Just gotta get this fucker open. There we go, right in there. Oops, might have nicked the bottom there a little bit. That's okay. Get a fat yeah. Oh. Oh. oh, there it is. Oh, look at that. Valhalla, Valhalla achieved. There we go. Now we got this wedged open. We're gonna. Simple as that. Okay, so now... Oh, look at that, it's even got a hard shell. It's even got laminate. Keep this bad boy safe. Dig deep and breathe. There we go. Remember, kids, if you have a priceless paperback artifact, a really sharp box cutter is the perfect tool to get it out of there. There we go. There it is. Okay. Let's get my, get my comic. My comic I paid for. Be sure to, um, by the way, check out Disturb's new album, Indestructible, in stores. Um... Now, fuck this, I gotta go. God of War, Chains of Olympus for the PSP. Pretty good game. Let's see. Batman, Batman, Batman. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Yep, there it is. It's hard to tell. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get some shots, but it's hard to tell, but yeah, you can... Oh, yeah. Ooh. 
Ooh, they used the C word. Ooh, I might have to recensor that. This is educational, but YouTube doesn't respect me. Ooh, yeah. All right, cool. Normally here, this is where we would put a wrap-up segment for the comic book. I'd give my final thoughts on the whole thing, poke and prod at the fleshy exterior that people can use to re-cement their own opinions against mine, or jump to in lieu of actually watching the whole video, but I can't do that. Each and every panel of All-Star Batman and Robin the Boy Wonder has far too much to talk about to do that. Most of it's bad. Not all, but most of it. There are, however, three important points that I can make to wrap this up. The first is, without a doubt, this is my new favorite bad comic ever printed of all time. People often have bad movies and TV shows that they adore, and this one's gonna get the same level of praise from me for the rest of my life. It's a perfect microcosm of poor writing, dumb characters, and misplaced cynicism, all wrapped up in a downright gorgeous illustrated package. Read it for yourself, even though I just gave you the guided tour. The way certain moments hit in this is downright indescribable secondhand. And I just really fucking love this comic now. Second, if you're watching this on stream with your chat and donators, I want to let your audience know that I am the greatest content creator who's ever lived. And if you're not subscribed to me personally and only watch my videos secondhand, you're doing yourself a massive injustice and will forever have a void in your life that can never be filled by any imitator or anyone inspired by me. Thank you for watching, and you're welcome for my service. And third, and most importantly, I just realized that Robin's first name is Dick, which is a synonym for penis. That's really funny, and I probably should have made a joke about it.